Hello, Global Gardeners. It's Monday. Let's talk gardening today. I'd like to focus on seeds and specifically I'll be talking about seed bundles in particular, how we choose our seeds and maybe throw out some ideas about my recommendations and thoughts about how you can approach your seed buying or seed borrowing or seed taking, whatever it happens to be. So nice to have everybody here and we're celebrating Martin Luther King Jr. Day here in the United States. So we might actually have some people join us today who haven't been here for a while because it is a national holiday and it's a great day to honor a great man and also to talk about gardening, specifically talking about the seeds that we're all using. Nice to see everybody checking in. Pat Patrick is here from a cold and snowy Colorado. It's, I've still got snow on the ground and there's more snow coming on Tuesday and the long range forecast looks like I've got snow. Well, I haven't had this much snow in a few years at least. So I've been doing a lot of indoor gardening and planning for what the season's going to look like, which is why I'm thinking seeds. I'm guessing you're thinking seeds as well. I wanna share one of those senior gardener moments that I had this, this week that was actually kind of uh, discouraging for a little while, but I got it all resolved this morning, as a matter of fact. So in a recent video, I, I showed uh, catalogs. I love catalogs. I love looking through catalogs. So I've been perusing my catalogs for a few weeks now, choosing the specific varieties of seeds I'm planning to get, even though every year I say I'm not going to get any more seeds. And I was getting ready to make a purchase this weekend and I couldn't find my catalogs. It was disheartening. It was stressful. I scoured my house trying to figure out what happened to my seed catalogs. And for the life of me, I couldn't figure it out. But as with most things that cause us such turmoil, I couldn't stop thinking about it. And so last night, as I was falling asleep, I had a thought. I woke up this morning and found the catalogs. And the thought was, as I show in that video I made, I sit in my chair as I look through my catalogs and I set the catalogs off to the side and look through another one and set that off to the side. And the epiphany that I had last night was the catalogs fell off the table. The table is right next to the wall. And so if the catalogs had just slid off the table, they were hidden between the wall and the table. So this morning, that was one of the first things I did when I got up was to go look and sure enough, my 10 or 12 catalogs were all hiding between the wall and the table. So I'm good to go. And when we're done here today, I'm actually gonna place an order for some of the seeds in that catalog. And you'll see in a video coming out Thursday, why I think the catalogs and my catalogs are so important because I'm choosing a lot of new varieties this year that I'm looking forward to growing. There's a hello to Nick from Yuma, a new member of the Gardener Scott channel. Nice to have you joining us, Nick, and uh, I'm sure you'll look forward to some of the nice perks that you can have as a channel member. So thanks for joining the channel and thanks for being here today as well. Hello to Gilles from Cornwall, Ontario, Canada. And of course, we've got uh, a lot of our other regulars from Canada and moderators as well. Shout out to, to Jay and to Heidi. So looking forward to have a good day today talking about seeds and being a little more relaxed that I don't have to worry about my lost catalogs as we move forward. So a creative girl homestead, hello to you as well and everybody else that's in the chat. So um, why, why am I wanting to talk about the, the, the bundles of seeds? And, and so when I talk about seed bundles, the idea is that when you order seeds, because you because you'll occasionally see these in the store, but but often if you go to one of the nurseries that's selling seeds or a seed producer website, you can buy a bundle of seeds. For years and years and years, what I've done and what I often recommend 
is that you choose specific varieties that you want to grow in your garden and you'll buy individual seed packets. But the companies make it easy for you and they'll bundle 10 seed packets or 25 seed packets or 100 seed packets and you buy the bundle. And I think there's advantages to that and I think there's also some disadvantages to that. And so the reason I'm really bringing it up today is because some of you may have seen in that short video I did on Friday, and I also put it out through social media, that I worked a, a partnership with Survival Garden Seeds, and they're supplying me, you, with the possibility of winning three of their 100 seed farmer seed vaults. And that's what really got me thinking. Last year, I, I planted a whole bunch of seeds from Survival Garden Seeds after getting their bundles. And it was new for me because, as I said, I usually get the individual seed packets. So last year, I thought, let me try this out. And so I got their, their 25 seed bundle and their 100 seed bottle, bundle and chose some of the plants to grow, the seeds themselves, germinated fine. The plants do wonderfully. But it got me thinking for this year to actually share some of my thoughts and the experiences that I've had when we talk about a seed bundle. And I don't think they are for everybody, but I think they could be for most gardeners. And here's why I say that. One of the reasons that these seed bundles are put together is really targeting brand new gardeners. New gardeners who really have little clue about what to grow because as you well know, gardening can be daunting and the selection of your plants can be quite stressful. So if you can just buy a bundle of 10 or 25 seeds, that takes away some of that stress and that gives you the opportunity to put seeds into the garden that someone else has chosen for you, but usually there's a theme or there's a reason why those seeds have been bundled together. Once you develop more experience with gardening, you may find that the seed packets that are in the bundles really don't match with what you want or with how you garden. And so that's a period that I think most of us as gardeners tend to buy the individual seed packets, the ones that we are specifically looking for. And then as you get older in your, your gardening journey and you have more and more of that experience like I was last year, it's like, let's give it a try. Let's see what is in that seed bundle that I might not have been aware of and otherwise chosen. And that was one of the, the, the revelations I had from last year was I grew plants that I had never grown before, that I probably would have never grown, but because they were part of a bundle pack, I had no reason not to grow them. And so I discovered delicata squash. I had never grown a delicata squash before, and I loved it. I would have never have discovered that type of squash if I hadn't have gotten a seed bundle and then put those seeds into my garden. This year, I still have a lot of those seeds from those packages from, or from those, those uh, library of seeds last year. Now I'm moving back into what I discovered last year gave me basic ideas of new things that I have enjoyed. And now I can go back and look for very specific varieties of delicata squash that might be better or do better for me in my garden. So, so that's the initial thought that I wanna throw out at you and we'll revisit this as you ask questions and I'd love for you to share your experiences with the seed bundles that, that you might have tried in the past. But I, I can see this as a way to help you on your gardening journey. In the beginning, get a seed bundle because you don't know any different. In the middle of your journey, do it your way with what you want. And then as you get to the edges of your journey, start getting back to the idea of surprise and having someone else tell you what is a good idea to try in your garden. That little bit of, 
of experimentation that I always say is a nice thing to to try in your garden. So there's some thoughts. Let's go ahead and see what you all are saying. High Plains Drifter in extreme southwest Kansas. I'm wondering on when to start my seeds indoors for tomatoes and other early plants. I've got season extenders to protect from frost. I'm looking at February. Would that be okay? So uh, it depends. I actually have a video, and uh, no doubt Jay will be on top of things and give a link to this. But I have a video, I think, from early last year on when to start seeds. And there isn't a single answer to this question because, first off, it depends on the plants that you want to grow as to when you start the seeds for those plants. And it depends on your climate and your meteorological data that has determined your last frost date. So in Kansas, southwest Kansas, I'm guessing you're not much different than, than my region here in Colorado, which probably means your last frost date is sometime in May. Use that as a guideline to determine when to start your plants. And then the seed packets, in most cases, will give you very specific guidance. If the seed packet doesn't, then you might need to do a little bit of additional research. But for tomatoes, typically tomatoes are started from seed indoors six to eight weeks before your last frost date. So if your last frost date is in May, that means you really shouldn't be starting tomatoes until the end of March or beginning of April. That's when I start my tomato seeds to put them outside. Pepper seeds generally are 10 to 12 weeks before the last frost date. And so again, using May as an example in this case, you might wanna be starting your, your pepper seeds indoors in, in the beginning of March conceivably. It all depends on when you're going to be putting these plants outside. Now, the season extenders do allow you to have some flexibility in that. And so depending on what kind of season extender you're going to use, I feel comfortable with an extra two weeks on the front of it. So I've used the Walla Water system as season extenders in the past. And I normally put my tomatoes out in my garden in the beginning of June. And in the past, I've put my tomatoes in my garden using the season extenders the first or second week of May. Still gets cold, I still get snow, but those type of season extenders are enough to keep the young plants alive. If you're just using hoops and plastic, they'll buy you a week, maybe two weeks of season extension. So uh, take, a, take a look at your last frost date to get a general idea of when you should start your seeds. And then depending on how robust your season extension is, you can add an extra one, two, or maybe three weeks to the, the date that you start your seeds. And that's to be safe. You can certainly start earlier than that. But the problem you run into, in fact, actually uh, on the uh, In the Garden with Eli and Kate channel this week, their video from yesterday talks about this idea that if you start your seeds too early, you can end up with plants that are too big for your house. You run out of space and it's still too early to put them outside. I ran into this issue at the Galileo Garden years ago with our big greenhouse and I intentionally started them early but then we had unusually cold temperatures at the time that I would normally start planting. And my tomato plants were three feet tall by the time I got them in the ground. And they were stunted, having grown that big in pots. They didn't produce as well as they might normally produce because they just got too big in the pots before I could put them outside. So starting early is not always a good thing. You do need to balance it with your climate and with your uh, specific plant requirements and what those plants require as far as starting in advance. Good morning to you, Brian, sending my son and his wife a bundle pack for their garden. And glad to hear that. And that, that's kind of the approach I've taken as well. When I've given seeds away to family members or friends, especially if they were new to gardening, it's often a really easy 
way to, to send seeds is in a bundle pack. You don't have to be selective. You can just send a bundle. And usually a bundle will include a variety. And so a small bundle pack might have a packet of lettuce. It might have a packet of radish. It usually has a packet of some type of squash, some type of tomatoes, some type of pepper. And, and it gives a, a general way to start a garden with a number of different types of plants. Often they're very generic plants. And so below, and I didn't mention this earlier, if you want to enter that giveaway for the 100 seed packets, uh, please click on the link. I've got it in the description below. And next Monday is the last day. And they'll choose three people to, to win those 100 seed bolts. And so uh, if you go to the Survival Garden Seeds, for instance, to see their offerings within their various bundles, in that 100 seed bundle, I think they've got five or six different types of tomatoes and three or four different types of pepper and probably seven or eight different types of squash. And so the smaller bundles may only give one packet of a, of a variety of plants, whereas the bigger bundles usually follow that same basic variety, but they add extra seed packets of different types that, that you can try. And and you do, that's why I say early in your gardening career, often they're not gonna tell you the specific name. So like for instance, in the seed bundle from the survival garden seeds is, is a seed packet that says beefsteak tomato. Well, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of varieties of beefsteak tomato. And so I don't know exactly what kind of tomato that is. I just know it's a beefsteak tomato. And that's one of the disadvantages, I think, in that mid-range. That's why I say I think most gardeners in the middle of their gardening journey get away from the bundles because you're buying a, a generic plant without really knowing the specific variety. And I like knowing the specific variety. The delicata squash is the same thing. There are a number of different types of delicata squash, but the seed packet just says delicata squash. It introduced me to a type of plant that I was unfamiliar with, and now enables me in the next season, this year for me, to do more research and find out what it is I'm really interested in. So a uh, great idea to, to send bundles, particularly to new gardeners, who maybe don't know enough to ask questions about what is the best variety. And it's a great way to be exposed to different plant types that you might not otherwise uh, decide to grow. Renee says, almost forgot to like this video. Oh, thanks. If you haven't already, this is a simple way of thanking Scott for giving us his time and knowledge. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Renee. That's, that's wonderful. Uh, okay, let's see. What, what did High Plains Drifter add? Uh, I was looking at starting them on February 14th. I used to start all my plant seeds at the same time. Never thought about starting at different times. Your Vault of Impel. That you have taken a, a title from a video that I'm working on right now, which is uh, why you don't plant all of your seeds at the same time. And uh, it's, it's all based on what I was just talking about, that they have different rates of germination and different rates of growth. And because I used to do the same thing, I used to start all of my seeds at the same time indoors and ended up with some that were too small and some that were too big. And it, it really is a good idea to stagger the, the sowing times when you're starting your plants indoors uh, to get, get the, the best success. Lars says, I use heat mats and grow lights for my seeds. I learned to reduce the amount of time before transplanting. I got tired of transplanting large plants. Good for you, Lars. Uh, that's the, the video I have coming out on Saturday. It's going to be talking about heat mats. And uh, that's, that's one of those things that I learned as well over time. I used to start seeds indoors, and it was after many years of mixed success that I really learned that heat mats and the lights as well, like Lars says, can make a big difference when you're starting your seeds indoors. But that also affects the timing because the heat mats will, will cause the germination to happen faster. It accelerates 
the initial growth of that seed into a seedling. And so if you're used to starting your seeds at one particular time of year and then you start using a seed mat, you may find out that, that you gain a week of growth on your plants because those seeds will germinate faster when you use a seed mat. So I love seed mats. Uh, I'll show you in that or talk about and show you in that video that they're not best for all seeds, but for some seeds, they're really almost necessary to get the good germination and to save some time. Those hot pepper seeds that I've been talking about in recent weeks, they can take a month to germinate. With a heat mat, that accelerates the process. And so we may say, uh, or the seed packets may say that you start your pepper seeds 10 to 12 weeks before your last frost date. Well, if the first four weeks are spent on just waiting for the seeds to germinate, it can throw off the whole schedule that you may have laid in place. And so uh, look for that video as we as we come to the next weekend and I'll, I'll explain much more about seed the heat mats for seeds and how they work and and demonstrate how it actually warms the soil so uh, it's it's a nice thing to have if you are thinking about getting it coastal crocus i found that staggering seed starts is also necessary just due to lack of space in heated propagation area excellent excellent point that's that's one of the things that i talk about in some of my seed starting videos and, and that's why I do it the way I do it. I do most of my seed starting in the flats with the little cells. And then I transplant from there into bigger pots to, to this point exactly. I have a limited number of shelves that I have lights for those flats. And they don't fit pots real well. I have a different area with lights for my pots. So I do exactly this just exactly what they recommend. I start my seeds underneath the lights at the appropriate time. And then usually it's starting with peppers. I take those seedlings and transplant them into a bigger pot, move them to another area, and then use those lights and that shelf to start the next batch of seeds, which might be tomatoes. And so for me, what I've called it in my videos is like a conveyor belt where you're always moving your seedlings from one area to another, and a lot of it depends on how much space you have. And so when I, when I had the big greenhouse at the school, this is the way I did it, and I'm planning to do it this year now that, I, now that I've got the greenhouse going into spring. And that's to start indoors with the space and the lights you have, move some of those plants out into the greenhouse when it's warm enough, that frees up space inside to start more plants. And once you figure that method out that works best for you, you'll learn that you can actually grow many more plants than you thought you could because you're moving them around and you're using your space the, the most efficient way that you can. So uh, I agree with you, Coastal Crocus, staggering the seed starts is a great way to, uh, to take advantage of the space you do have in the most efficient and effective way. So, okay, let's see, Bohemian Herbology, get it in and do the best you can with what you got. Perfect, yeah, absolutely, that's a nice way to approach it. North Chester County News, I found while using wood chips, used following the Back to Eden method, as good insulation and moisture barrier, it also keeps the soil cooler in the spring. Yes, absolutely, and, and so, uh, you can use that to your advantage, uh, depending on what it is you're growing and when you choose to grow it. And so the wood chips definitely act as an insulator. And so when the ground gets cold, it stays cold. If you want to start your season earlier, you can just rake up the wood chips and allow the soil to warm up. And that will probably give you a few weeks earlier sowing and planting than if you leave all the wood chips in place. If you want a more gradual increase in the soil temperature and all the microbes are waking up and the soil needs time to, to get ready for the plants, you can leave those chips in place. So I do both. Around my fruit trees, I don't want my trees waking up too early. 
because here in Colorado, we get some late freezes and I've lost trees and I've lost a lot of buds and blossoms on my trees from those late freezes. So around my fruit trees, I have wood chips, very, very thick, like the Black to Eden method, Back to Eden method. And those wood chips keep the soil cooler longer, which helps me at least when it comes to the fruit trees. They don't wake up as quickly in the spring. So about the time they're waking up and starting to bud and starting to bloom, hopefully, the, the, the late freezes are done with. I've found that the, the varieties in particular that, that wake up early and start blooming early are the ones that I rarely get any fruit from. And so peaches and apricots, for instance, are really difficult to grow in my area of Colorado because many of them wake up early and start budding and their blossoms are beautiful on the tree when we have a hard freeze that kills all the blossoms. Well, you can delay the trees waking up by using uh, a heavy mulch and keeping it in place. Or in other areas of my garden, I will rake aside the mulch so that the soil warms up and I can get a good start and put some seeds. Uh, and, and that's usually in my flower garden, the perennial garden and the pollinator garden area where I'll actually move aside the mulch to, to put some seeds in and get a good start working on that as well. Gardens Happen says, maybe I should throw some wood chips over my garlic. Yeah, definitely, definitely consider using wood chips as a mulch on your garlic. The, the plants, the garlic plants are, are hardy and sturdy. And when those leaves start growing, they can punch through a, a small wood chip without any difficulty at all. And the wood chips also for the garlic help keep the soil temperatures at a nice appropriate temperature and a nice gradual uh, in, increase of the temperature as the spring comes. So uh, I, I use straw primarily on my uh, garlic, but in some of the containers that I'm doing this year, I did sprinkle a light layer of chips on top of the straw going into the winter. So. Not a bad idea to think about. Bud says all the benefits of heat mats are real, but in my excitement to use them when I first got them led to problems. Don't use on cool weather crops. Absolutely. And that's one of the things actually I'll be talking about in the video at the end of this week is that uh, I, I don't use them on plants like lettuce and spinach, all those cool season plants. And there's a few reasons for that. One, it's not necessary those seeds will germinate without the extra heat, but with the extra heat, and I'm guessing this is what you're referring to, but it causes very fast germination and very fast growth. And those cool season plants when on a heat mat usually get pretty leggy pretty fast. And you've just kind of destroyed your chances for that crop because once the seedlings get too leggy too fast, it's really hard to recover from that. So I, I use them almost exclusively on my uh, warm weather crops, the, the peppers and the eggplant and the tomatoes and all those kind of plants that will benefit from the extra heat because they grow in hot conditions. So uh, thanks for pointing that out, bud, that uh, it, it can run to, into some problems. And the other problem I've had, especially with the cool season plants with heat mats, is that it can cause the soil to dry out faster. And so you've got these young plants that are growing very quickly, like lettuce tends to do. It's absorbing a lot of water faster than a lot of the other seedlings. And the heat mat is warming up to the point that it's causing some of the moisture in the soil to evaporate. So you have the young plants sucking up water, and then you have the soil warm enough that it's evaporating out, and it requires more attention and extra water. And so if you water at the rate you might have always watered at without the heat mat, it might be like me. You end up killing plants because you decided to try to help them out with warmth and the soil dries out and it's not a good thing. So I'll talk more about that in that video, but all good things to consider. Carol's wondering in zone 7B, can I start seeds in cold frame? Haven't got room for indoor seeding uh, or starting. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you should be able to. Again, 
take a look at your specific climate and what your weather patterns will be. And so uh, 7B means that your, your average lowest winter temperature is going to be 5 degrees Fahrenheit. That's about minus 15 Celsius. And so there's a lot that you should be able to grow in a cold frame. But when is your coldest temperature? So when you hit that 5 degrees in winter, does that happen in December or does it happen in March? Because a cold frame can be a great way to warm up the soil, to get the seeds germinating, and to get those young plants growing. But it's not really going to add more than about 10 degrees Fahrenheit of protection. And so if you don't get that 5 degree Fahrenheit cold winter temperature until February, then even starting in a cold frame right now may not be a good idea because come February, when you hit those cold temperatures, even with the protection of the cold frame, it's still gonna be so cold in there that it might be too cold for those young seedlings that are starting to grow. So, so look at the timing of your temperatures as to the best time to start in a cold frame. If you can ensure that your coldest temperatures are going to be above about 18 degrees Fahrenheit, that's minus eight Celsius, then you should be able to get away with putting anything into a cold frame and, and have it survive. As long as you're choosing those cool season plants that can handle the, the cool weather at night. Even in a cold frame, in cold conditions, the peppers and the tomatoes might germinate, but if you have that cold snap, it's, it's gonna be enough to to, to kill the plant. So a cold snap isn't going to kill a spinach plant, but a cold snap might kill a pepper plant if you do it in a cold frame during the late winter or early spring. So, so do look at your own specific weather in deciding when to start a cold frame. And if you're already in that mode in zone 7b where it's starting to warm and every day just gets warmer, then yeah, it might be something you can do. For those of us in the roller coaster weather of Colorado, we don't have that gradual warm up. So we do have to be much more conservative when we start with our, our cold frames or our greenhouses or our hoop houses because they offer some protection, but they don't offer protection against that intense cold that could hit for some of us. Mike's wondering, does the amount of hours you leave lights on affect onions? I usually aim for 14 hours on most plants. Should I put onions on a different timer? 14 hours should be good. I usually aim for 14 to 16 hours for most of my seedlings. And the, the bulbing of the onions is actually triggered after the plant has, has gotten bigger. So the amount of time you you put your onion seedlings under the lights isn't really going to affect whether they bulb or not. It's when they're in the ground and actively growing that will determine when they're exposed to the sunlight, whether they're a short day or long day or intermediate day variety. That's all based on the sun that they're getting once they're out in the garden in the ground. But as a seedling, uh, 14 hours is actually a good target for pretty much all of the seedlings that you're going to be growing from seed indoors. As the plants get bigger, they're not going to need that much light. So I usually start my seedlings at 14 to 16 hours. And then about the time I'm moving them outdoors, I have decreased the amount of light to more closely match the amount of light that they're going to be getting outside. And so if I'm putting plants outdoors in May, where I might be getting 12 hours of, of good sunlight, usually I'm matching that with 12 hours of light indoors. And I, I really have never had a problem with that. And, and the plants will benefit from less light as well. So uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say go ahead and aim for 14. And, uh, and you can just keep it on the same timer as you have all the rest of your plants without too much of an issue. So, okay, let's see. 
Moondust is wondering, how would I set up an automatic grow life light to shut off by itself? Very, very easily. Get a, a plug-in timer, the kind of timer that you plug directly into your outlet, and you can set that for whatever time you want, and that timer will have a plug that you then plug your grow light into. And so I like the kind of timers that have two plugs. Those are the ones I use. So it's a, it's a three-prong plug that goes into the outlet, and on that is two sides, and each side has an outlet for a plug. So I can use one timer and actually plug two lights into it. And that's, that's why I say if you choose like 14 hours for your seedlings, you set your timer for 14 hours, you plug the two lights into your timer, and it's automatic. It comes on every day and goes off every day, whatever time you set. I usually have mine come on at about 5 in the morning for me, and I usually have them turn off at about 8 or 9 p.m. And uh, it just works like a champ. The lights come on and then they go off. It's that easy. So uh, you don't necessarily need to buy a fancy grow light that has everything built into it. Just get a simple light and a simple timer and you can have an automatic system. And uh, I, I show that, uh, got a couple videos, and but I, I, for, I think it might have been from last year, maybe the year before, but I actually show you how I set up my light system to include the timer and and there's really not a lot of uh, extra effort that you need to put into it other than just buying a timer that is easy for you to to program and and then have fun with it gardens happen says funny thing is i was dreaming i was making this video and started working on it the next day oh, okay i missed what you were talking about in the video i have to take a look at it and and see what we're talking about always nice to see the videos that you're putting out Rob's allotment channel uses tempo timers, so you can use a phone to set them. That, you know, that's one of those things. Uh, I'm I'm working on a few things, trying to to not be such an old timer and do things old school. But uh, that's a great idea: is to be able to program from your phone. And I'm starting to do a few things around my house along those lines, but I haven't actually done it for timers to to put on the um, uh, on the plants so uh, interesting idea I appreciate that suggestion Rob there's always some nice things to, to learn about Karen's wondering does anyone know where to find agi crocane turnip seeds Baker Creeks are out of stock um, I don't know that but if you know an answer to that question to help Karen out by all means put it into the comments there it, it raises a good point that's one reason why i was so discouraged when i thought i had lost my seed catalogs you need to be ordering your seeds if you haven't ordered your seeds you really need to get to it because especially some of the more uh, unusual or hard to find seeds are going to be running out and baker creek has this issue every year with their seeds because they have some very unique varieties and they're the only ones that sell them. And when they're sold, they're sold. And so if you haven't got your seeds yet, you might want to take some steps to get those seeds. If it's the generic seeds that everybody sells, it's not that big an issue. It's if you want very specific seeds that you really need to be most concerned about uh, ordering before they, they run out. And, Every year, there's something that I want to order that's out of stock. And I do try to get an early start as, as much as I can. And there's just obviously not enough of those seeds to go around and other gardeners that get into it uh, before I can. Hi, Plains Drifter. Are there any root plants that will help break up heavy soil? Absolutely. I, I talked about this in a, a video at the beginning of last year with my cover crops. I was using daikon radish as one of my cover crop plants. And daikon is a perfect example of a plant that grows very easily, pretty quickly, and is suitable for most gardens. And that big, thick, long daikon radish root can break through 
some pretty tough soil. So I actually have daikon radish in a lot of areas of my garden to, to break up the heavy soil that I have uh, in areas that I'm trying to improve my soil. And so there are lots of other plants that, that fall into that category. You, you need to look at like a cover crop uh, and see if it has those type of seeds in it. But, but carrots and, and the daikon radish, those big thick roots, that's a good place to start uh, as far as choosing a plant that, that, that is easy to grow and something that does break apart the soil. And then you can either just leave it in place and it will decompose. And that's one reason why I've done the daikon radish in areas that I'm not going to get to for another year or two is the radish will sprout. It breaks apart the soil. It really helps decompact it. And then I leave the, the, the root in place. It's going to rot and decompose. And now there's a big hole where that root was for compost and mulch and other organic matter to decompose and fill that hole. So not only does it help break apart heavy soil, but it also creates a place for organic matter to find its way into the soil and gradually improve the soil overall. So it's kind of a long-term approach, but hopefully that gives you some ideas of something you, you might want to um, experiment with. Those deep, big roots can help you out. Grateful for gardening. Dug up a grapevine last year. Can't tell if it was from a seed that dropped or from the vine. <coughs> Does it make a difference? Um, maybe. Um, it all depends on what kind of grape it is. And so if it's a, an, a classic grape with a, a seed that, that will grow the same type of plant, then the new plant will be just like the plant that dropped the seed. But if it's a hybrid that's been developed for a specific taste or specific growth or specific disease resistance, then the seed is not going to grow into the same type of plant. So it, it depends. It depends on whether it's an open pollinated or heirloom variety of grape or whether it's a hybrid grape. And both are sold. So just check to see what the variety is from your, your parent plant, and that'll help give you an idea of whether that new plant is going to be the, the same. And that's, that's the big difference. I just saw Mala's tail walk by. Uh, that's the big difference is you'll, you'll still get a grapevine. It's just a question of whether it will give you the same fruit that maybe you're hoping to get. And, and that's the problem. If it was a hybrid, it, it won't give you the same fruit. It, it's going to be something different. Two gals from Vermont. Santa got me a weather station. Good for you. I've been enjoying mine. In our microclimate, found that we, ha we are 5 to 10 degrees colder than down the street. Also got soil therm from my hoops. We'll see if planting will be earlier. Uh, so a thermometer for my hoops, I think, is, is what that means. Uh, that, that's good. And that's, that's, uh, that's one of the reasons why I suggest that people get a weather station, because I discovered the same thing. In fact, I suspected after I set up my weather station and started keeping track of it, I thought it would need to be recalibrated because the readings I was getting from my weather station were not the same as the National Weather Service reports for my area from a station that's about eight or nine miles away. And then the, the weather station that I got is actually part of a network and it allows me to see what the other weather stations in my neighborhood are doing. And so I thought there was a problem with the calibration of my unit but no, I discovered that in my area, I'm about five to six degrees Fahrenheit cooler than the official temperature readings that are nearby. So uh, I'm glad you discovered that because that is one of those things that can make a difference when we put our plants out and when we start our seeds, especially if we're looking at the calendar and looking at the, the official forecast, it might not match our specific gardens. So. Uh, good for you. I'm, I'm glad to see if, or glad to see what uh, is, is happening with you having a weather station and using it. I think that's nice. And uh, let's hope that you can use it to your advantage. 
Jordan Marie Organics. Nice to see you here. Thank you so much for that super chat contribution. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and time and guiding us in our gardening efforts. I love doing it. The Facebook group has also been an invaluable resource. Awesome. And, and I know you're new to that Facebook group and new to the channel membership, but I'm glad you're enjoying it. That is, I think that's the best perk that we offer with the uh, Gardner Scott channel membership is that Facebook group because people are helping and, and, and just so supportive in all ways and pictures and videos and questions and answers and, and it's all good. So thank you so much, Jordan Marie Organics and nice to, to have you here and sharing that information. Grateful for gardening. I can't remember where I got it. The best Concord purple Concord I ever had grows in Oregon 8B. We'll start one from the plant. They grow fast. I, I love Concord grapes, and I actually put in two uh, Concord grape plants this last year. I'm hoping they made it through my winter. Uh, that's a wonderful plant to grow. And so um, it, it's nice when you, when you have a plant that you're happy with and successful. And don't feel bad. I've got so many things I'm growing that I don't remember where they came from either. But I know they're happy in my garden, and I know I'm happy having them in my garden. And if I can propagate them and spread them to other areas, that even makes it that much better. So that's that's fun. Uh, okay, Riverdale is here. Nice to have you here. River and Dale don't always have the ability to join us on Mondays, so nice that you're here. Membership is very much worth it. Well, thank you. Thank you for saying that. I, I, I appreciate that. I, I, I love the group that we have and, and doing all the other things that we do. So Sonia's wondering, uh, is it a membership-based group? Yes, it is. So it's, it's the Gardner Scott Community Facebook page. And to join it, you, you do need to have a membership through the YouTube membership. And so in the, in the description below, there's a link if you're interested in becoming a, a channel member. If you're on a PC, there's actually a little blue and white button underneath the screen that says join. That's a way to do it. And then there's different levels uh, that give you different perks depending on which level you, you join the membership. But all the levels have access to the Facebook group. Uh, but yes, it is a it is a membership group on Facebook and a great, great group of people. Andrea, I wish I knew the variety of groups growing in my backyard when I moved in. Unfortunately, they were so invasive to everything else around, had to remove them. Sorry to hear that. I love growing group grapes and, and it can be difficult for me. So uh, I, I, I fully understand that problem. And, and, you know, be careful what you wish for because I wish I had that problem. I wish I had so many grapes that I had to deal with getting rid of some of them in a challenging environment. But good luck to you getting them under control because any plant, and this, you know, this holds true with the notorious plants like the mint and the horseradish that can take over a space. But even for those plants that aren't necessarily thought of as invasive, can be invasive. If they have a happy space in a garden, they'll grow and they'll spread. And grapevines can definitely fall into that category that, that if they're happy, they'll grow and spread and it could become a problem. So uh, that holds true with a lot of other plants. And uh, just be aware of that. When you have that happy plant in your garden, you may need to stay on top of it so that it doesn't spread. And it the, the spreading isn't necessarily a bad thing. Last year, I was looking for spreading of my cosmos, for instance, and my cosmos were spreading throughout the garden, and I was very happy with that. But at some point, my cosmos could reach the, the stage that they're interfering with the growth of other flowers that I want to grow instead. So initial spreading of a plant can be a good thing, but you do also have to be careful that it doesn't go too far and that you need to stay on top of it to make sure that that doesn't happen. And so, uh, oh, Riverdale it says that uh, they're getting a weather station soon. So uh, that's wonderful. Yeah, uh, that, that, that says River is, is the young one that is getting into gardening as a child, which I think is such a wonderful idea. 
And Dale, of course, is the one that's guiding her on the adventure and the journey. So good, good for you. I think I think a weather station really does help you take gardening to the next level uh, as far as tracking what's happening in your garden and then using that to your benefit, like recognizing that your garden is five or 10 degrees cooler than what you thought it was. That will impact your plants. If you've had difficulty with plants in the past with germination and you didn't know why, it could be that your garden is five to 10 degrees Fahrenheit cooler than the, the, the official forecast and that's what's causing the problem. And so uh, just one of those extra things. Do you need a weather station? Of course not. You can garden without it. I garden for decades without a weather station. But now that I have one, it's really helping me refine some of my planning when it comes to when I put the seeds and the plants in the ground. So that, that can be a, a really interesting idea. So Mohamuda, hello to you from Bangladesh. I, every week I, I talk about what a great global audience this is and so nice to have you joining us from Bangladesh. That's that's fantastic. So hello to you, my friend, as well. Brian saying my son went to the University of Wisconsin up in Stevens Point when he got out of the service. Fantastic. You know, I um, I, I never thought I was going to go into gardening and and make all my videos and everything else when I was in the military and it wasn't until I retired that I really developed this interest. So uh, I, I think that's fantastic when you get out of the service and go to school and find whatever it is that, that is of interest to you and move in that direction. The, the military is a nice way to develop some good skills to head you in the right direction once you do find what it is that you like. Dusty Flat says, local meteorologists have too many models to look at. We are now down to the day of hang your head out the window. My dog told the weather better. You know, and, and it can be tough. When I, was, when I was in the Air Force and I was running the flight ops at the Air Force Academy, the meteorologist worked for me and used to go in every day. And we would compare forecasts. And, and these were trained meteorologists. And you're right. They have lots of different models to look at. They've got all their equipment. They're trying to figure out which is the right forecast. And I would make my own forecast. And, and I, I don't mean this to, to toot my own horn, but, but I was as right about the forecast as often as they were just on my basic training as, an, as a pilot and understanding weather because especially in an area like Colorado, right next to the Rocky Mountains. It's a tough job. It's really difficult, even when you're highly trained, to be able to figure out the forecast. And especially with each of us having our own unique space, that's why I'm a big fan of the weather station, because I can take a look at what's happening. And yeah, a lot of it is just hanging your head out the window and seeing what's happening and keeping track of it to see if you can develop any trends and patterns and then use those to your advantage in your garden. But uh, I, I've worked with a lot of meteorologists over the years and they have a thankless profession and it is so tough. It's one of those professions that 80% uh, accuracy is really, really good. And, and we had some of our forecasters that were in the 90% accurate range. But the problem is people only remember the 10% of the time that you got it wrong. They don't remember the 90% of the time that you got it right. So uh, it's, it's, it's tough. It really is tough. And, and not to say we all can do it better, but as far as gardening is concerned, I think sometimes we can make better choices for our own garden by looking at what's happening and having learned from our experience what it means when we hang our head out the window. Carla says, I compare my weather predictions with the weather guessers, but because I live in areas with microclimates, there can be a variation in the weather. Absolutely, and that's, that's a big issue, especially in our gardens and our own landscapes, it's the microclimates. And that's what I try to do, is try to, to learn those different areas, the microclimates within my garden space, and try to figure out how I'm going to use them 
to, to my advantage. Coastal crocus, don't forget about varying micro... Oh, there you go. Don't forget about varying microclimates within your own yard. Different elevations, trees, building orientation. Exactly. That, and that was the point I was just trying to make. That uh, my shed, my garden shed, in the middle of my garden has four distinct zones on each side of that shed. And each of those is a microclimate, which allows possibilities. And then you throw in my greenhouse, which has now just created new microclimates and everything else. Yeah, my yard, I've got a bigger yard, of course, but it's filled with microclimates. And when you identify the microclimates within your own space, it really can open up a lot of possibilities with what you're going to be doing in your garden. That was actually um, one of the very first videos I did in my new house three years ago was a video on microclimates. And that's exactly what I did was walk around my landscape and try to identify the microclimates. This was before I was growing anything. I was identifying the microclimates in my garden space. And that actually helped me figure out where I was going to put my garden beds because I had identified the microclimates before I ever put a bed in place. And so uh, I hadn't thought about that video in a while, but that's almost three and a half years old now. And microclimates can play a big part in the success of your gardening. Grateful for gardening, another new member. Thanks for joining. So glad to see you and look forward, like we were talking about, maybe to see you on the Facebook page. So I'll be, I'll be looking for that as it comes up. Uh, okay, let's see. Dusty Flats is saying, never seen this weather in my whole life for January. You know, we're having a really weird January. I can remember a similar, similar January about 15 years ago, maybe 16 years ago. And that's another reason why you, it's helpful to keep track of things like weather in your, your garden because I'm having a really weird weather January, um, but it's not so weird that I haven't seen it before. It's just been a long time since I've seen it. And so uh, Dusty Flats and everyone else, when you see those weird weather patterns, make note of it. And as you modify, if you have to modify your garden, make note of that. And then if the trend repeats at some point in the future, even 15 years into the future, you can have a pretty good or at least a better idea of how to handle that particular issue when it comes to weather, which is definitely a problem. And uh, it's, you know, a lot of it is, is California and, and just the extreme rain that's happening in California right now. And the snow, I grew up in Reno, Nevada, which is on the other side of the mountains from California. And we learned about the Donner Party, which you may or may not be aware of. And they were inundated with snow in the year they were trying to cross the mountains to get to California. And disaster happened. Well, those same kind of conditions are happening right now in the Sierra Nevada mountains because of these crazy weather patterns that are hitting California and then moving across the rest of the United States. So it's impacting a lot of people. And it really is weather that many of us have not seen in our lifetimes. That it may have happened historically, that doesn't do any good for those of us that are having to deal with it right now. So to all of you in California right now, and Oregon as well, struggling through some of these issues. Um, I, I hope you can see recovery soon. The water is great. You know, we all need the water. The drought conditions out west have been terrible. This is helping, but it's just crazy to have this much, this fast, this early. And so let's hope we can all get through it in a, a nice, easy way. Uh, before I forget, let's go ahead and talk about the, the picture behind me today. This comes from Barbara Kerbel Riker. And uh, I, I, I want to point out a couple things. There's a lot I like about this. And I, I'm not able to show the whole picture. And so if you send me a picture, please send it to me in landscape format. And so this picture was sent in portrait format. And so I can't show the, the whole picture on the background. Um, but but I am showing what I think is one of the most important aspects to, to highlight Barbara's garden. 
and it's that it's winter, things aren't growing, and they're working on their garden. They're expanding their garden. They're putting in more beds, and I think that's a great idea. I've, I've done some of my best garden expansion in December and January here in Colorado when we had warm days and I could get outside and actually do some work. And this, this is what they're doing. So you can see that they've got these metal beds, metal raised beds that they're putting in place. And this is the way I like to build my garden, exactly what they've done. They've got two beds. And so these, these are older beds that they actually have soil in. And now they're expanding the garden by adding more beds that have yet to be filled. But this is, this is a nice way to think about your garden, especially if you're a new gardener. You lay out your garden space and you have a plan for how many beds you think are gonna go into that space. But you don't need to build everything right away. You can take your time. That's what I'm doing in my garden on my five-year plan is every year I add more to the garden. So in your first year, just do two beds. Just do two raised beds, figure out your climate, figure out your weather, figure out how you like to garden. And then when you're ready, add more beds. And, and this is a similar approach that I take. You, know, you start with two, and then the next year you add four. And then the year after that, maybe you don't add any, but I see lots of space on this other side that they, they have some, some trellises set up or ready to go in this area and change, modify, adjust your plan as needed. You may have a plan for beds. I see potential, maybe there's space on the other end here for more raised beds. You can plan to do your raised beds and maybe it turns out to be an in-ground bed or maybe it turns out to be containers that you're growing in. None of that really matters. You've got to match with what you want to do. And if you plan to do a particular type of bed and then change your mind, that's okay. But don't feel like you have to build the entire garden all at once and that you need to have figured out the best way to do it in the beginning and that that can never change. And so I just see lots of potential in this garden space, potential with the beds that they've just put in that they're gonna be filling, but then also potential around the edges as they expand the garden. So along the fence line, adding grow bags or maybe growing grapevines up the fence. There's so much potential. I love seeing the potential in gardens. And so this, this is a great picture and I appreciate you sending it to me, Barbara, because especially when I ask for your pictures from you all that we can share, I think I, that many of you might be thinking, oh, I can't send a picture because my garden's not finished yet, or it doesn't look pretty enough. Well, this is a new garden that's in the process of being built, and they sent me a picture to share. So thank you so much for sharing what you're doing in your garden and allowing me the opportunity to to talk about it and the, the metal raised beds i'm starting to do more and more of those in my garden i've got a link to the forever garden beds in the description below that's the company that i've been getting my garden beds from and uh, i think they are an easy way to expand your garden because they're so easy to set up and so easy to move that if you've got an extra space and you're not sure what to do with it the metal guard beds now, have, I think, have revolutionized how many of us are looking at gardening because they really have made it easy to, to set up raised beds and, and expand a garden space. So uh, you can see the, the T posts here and you can see the, the, the fence around the edge. You can see the, the shed in the background. And uh, this, is, this is a nice garden space. So I, Barbara, I hope you send me a picture in the months ahead as plants start growing because I'd like to be able to, to take a look at the progress you've made once all the beds are filled and once everything is growing. I am running low on video, or not videos, the background pictures to show. And so send me your background picture at Gardner Scott at gardnerscott.com and ideally in a landscape so I can show the whole picture. And tell me a little bit about the story behind it. 
give me permission to use it, I still get pictures. And unless someone says that they specifically give me permission to use their picture, I'm not going to show it in a, a live stream like this. I'll enjoy it. I'll tell you I enjoy it. But if I haven't got the permission, I, I'm not going to show it. I just want to make sure that that you are giving me a picture, understanding that I am going to share it. And I love seeing everybody's gardens. I love seeing what others are doing. And one of the other things I wanted to point out, so when I put in my, my wooden raised beds, I had a lot of space between the beds to move my wheelbarrow. And so as you, as you lay your beds out, notice that there's enough room between the beds to walk. But there's also enough room on this other side that they can move a wheelbarrow and they can move a garden cart or whatever else they want to do to access their garden beds. And so there is no single answer as to how closely you place your beds. It all depends on how you garden. And so I look at the placement of these beds and think they're symmetrical. There's space to move around them and it should give a really nice growing environment. So like I said, Barbara, looking forward to a follow-up picture at some point in the future. And and thank you for, for sharing this with me today. And Gardens Happen, I will look for a picture from you soon. Uh, okay, uh, let's see. Let's scroll through. Oh, there's Jay. Thanks, Jay. There's that link to the Forever Garden Beds that I was talking about. And uh, yeah, they've got the 10% discount with the Gardener Scott uh, code. And that's one of the reasons I like using them is because uh, you can save some money by using the, the code. And they're not cheap. You know, this is a, I look at it as a, a mostly permanent way to garden. Because once you put those metal beds in place, they're going to be there for years and years and years. And so they're more expensive. But if you can save money in the process, that's definitely the approach that I think you should try to take if you can get away with it. So, okay, let's see. Um, I'm scrolling through to see if there's any questions that I may have missed. I also, in talking about the bundles before I forget, uh, I, I did want to, to mention the idea that there are some seed companies out there that allow you, in essence, to bundle your seeds. And so one of the advantages of buying a bundle is that they're typically less expensive than buying individual seeds. And so, like at Survival Garden Seeds, if you buy an individual pack, you're going to pay their, their price for individual packs. But if you buy a bundle, the cost works out to be less than you would pay if you bought each of those seeds individually. Now, granted, you're going to be getting seeds that you might not otherwise choose, but you can often buy a bundle of 30 seeds, for instance, at the cost of 20 or 25 seed packets. And so I've done that in the past as well. If I started looking for specific seeds that I wanted to grow, and then I saw a bundle that included those varieties that I was looking for, but yet the bundle was cheaper overall when you threw in the extra packets, it's a great way to get in essence, free seeds. It might not be seeds that you would have chosen, but it's seeds that you can add to your library. And there are, are some, I think Seeds and Such is, is one of the companies that the more seeds you buy, the cheaper it is per seed package. So in essence, you can follow that same pattern. If you want to buy 10 seed packets from a company, well, you may find that if you order 15 seed packets, the cost really isn't going to be that much more than if you had just ordered 10. And so do take the time as you as you look through the catalogs like I like to do to, to try to find out those kind of, of, of opportunities that you have with the catalogs. And shipping costs fall into that same category. There are some companies out there that if you buy a bundle, it's free shipping. And if you don't buy the bundle, if you buy the individual seed package, you got to pay for shipping. Well, when you look at the cost of shipping, often it's worth it to get the bundle. Even though it includes packages that you don't necessarily think you need, it's cheaper to get what you want and more because you get a bundle and you take advantage of the lower cost 
and or the free shipping that might be associated with it. So I'm always looking for a way to save money on seeds because I end up buying so many seeds. And, and that's just one of those ways to, to approach it that might work to, to your benefit. Uh, and then, you know, as, as we move forward, I, I was doing another seed audit this weekend and trying to figure out just exactly what it is I'm going to grow over the course of this season. And I'm, I'm going to gamble a little bit. I, in the past, one of the, the seed packets that was often in a bundle was with the Swiss chard, and they would sell it as rainbow chard. And so what it was was a seed packet that included the, the pink Swiss chard and the white Swiss chard and the red Swiss chard, and all of those seeds were in the same packet. I'm not normally a fan of those kind of packets because you just never know what you're going to get. And I like the yellow Swiss chard better than I like the red Swiss chard. And so you take some seeds and you sow them and you might end up with nothing but red Swiss chard in a plot just because of the randomness of where the seeds were, were sown and what's going to germinate and how they were even packed in the first place. And so one of these bundled seed packets that I got is that way with peppers. And this year I'm going to be growing a lot of peppers. You've heard me say this. But it's a, a packet that's got orange peppers and yellow peppers and small peppers and big peppers. And I normally wouldn't buy a package like that because you just don't know which seed matches which type of pepper. And I like more control in my garden than that. That's why I say this year, I think I'm going to roll the dice. I think I'm going to set aside one small bed of my garden and plant from that seed packet of peppers and just see what happens and just kind of have fun with it. It's that, that living on the edge a little bit. I've got the space and the time to do it. I wouldn't recommend it for, for, for a new gardener who's looking for a red bell pepper or a particular type of hot pepper. But to just have fun in the garden and just take a garden space and just sow some seeds and see what happens, I, I think that offers some fun that we often don't take advantage of in our gardens. And so these, these bundles will often give you something, like I said at the beginning, for us old experienced gardeners who are looking for something new and unexpected. Sometimes those seed packets that I wouldn't normally buy can present that. And so I'll, I'll let you know if I move forward with that and what happens with it at the, at the end of the season. So, uh, okay, I just want to throw that out. Dusty Flat says you get a mix. If you did a few, you may only get one kind. E exactly. And so that's why if you're, if you're getting one of those packets with a bunch of seeds in it, you need to plant a bunch of seeds. Uh, I... I made that mistake years and years ago, and that's why I bring it up, where I got one of those mixed packets and only germinated two or three seeds and didn't get the plant that I was hoping to get from those two or three. So you got to sow a whole bunch of seeds and then wait and see what happens. Colorado Bird Nerd, I got you hooked on shishito peppers. That's awesome. Those will be a must every year. Yeah, I was just talking to... Uh, uh, a gardener friend over the weekend, new gardener friend, who had said the same thing. They were going to try shishito peppers this year. And I said, good idea. If you're going to grow a, a, one pepper, I would choose the shishito pepper. I love peppers of all types, but it's definitely my favorite. And actually, I, I did that video recently where I'm going to start doing the hydroponics. I'm planning this week to start my shishito pepper plants for my hydroponic system. I've been trying to figure out what I want to grow in my hydroponic system, and shishito peppers are, are on the list. So I'll probably do some salad crops and shishito peppers in my hydroponic system before anything else. That's how much I like the shishito peppers. So there you go. Um, Monique is wondering if I grow medicinal plants. So I do grow some medicinal plants, but I don't grow them for the purpose of... Uh, or, or for medicinal purposes, for instance. So comfrey, for instance. Comfrey has been a medicinal plant 
for years and years and years. And stinging nettle is a medicinal plant. And I grow both of those. But the reason I grow those plants is for diversity in the garden and for their flowers, for the insects in the garden. And because their leaves can be turned into a very effective liquid fertilizer. And so I, I, I have many other plants that fall into that category. Herbs, I'm growing different herbs that are often seen as medicinal plants, but I'm not using them for medicinal purposes. On my list of potential videos in the future, and we're probably two years away from this if I'm still making videos in two years, uh, I am planning to do a video on growing medicinal plants for the purpose of, of the, the health benefits that some of these plants can, can uh, provide us. But no, I don't grow specifically for that reason, even though I am growing the medicinal plants. And, and there may be some information that I stick in other videos uh, as I make them that, that talk about the medicinal aspects of it. I know I've mentioned that a little bit in the past, but but that isn't a primary focus of mine and why I garden. And, but it is one of those reasons that many others do garden. So uh, if you're a medicinal uh, grower, uh, let me know. And if you've got some plant suggestions, I'm always looking for new things to grow, especially for that video in the future, as I, I want to decide what I'm going to feature in that video and if i already got the plant growing that's a win all the way around andrea says the jimmy nardello pepper is the most productive and prolific one ever grown i haven't grown the jimmy nardello but i had someone else that had suggested that to me next year and i think i've got that written down on my list as a potential pepper to grow so andrea you may have prompted me as i put my seed order together to maybe add Jimmy Nardello, especially if I can group it as part of a, a bundle and cost savings, I think that would be a wonderful option to do. Um, <clears throat> okay, let's see. Rob Zalotman says, with a thermostat, once your seeds are germinated, you can turn the heat down a bit. Absolutely. I actually um, usually turn my heat mats off shortly after the germination point. I, I lost... It's been two years ago. Two years ago, I lost an entire flat of peppers. And so I use the 72 cell trays. And I usually will sow two seeds per cell and sometimes more. So that flat had probably close to 150 pepper seedlings that was under the light and on a heat mat. And I killed them all because of what I mentioned earlier with the soil drying out. I missed watering one time and came back the next day and the soil had dried out and all those seedlings were dead. And so that was my big lesson when it comes to the heat mats, that once the seedlings are growing, at least for someone like me who might forget the time I was going to water, if I just turn the seat mat off or remove it completely, at least the seedlings probably aren't going to die if they miss out on one watering by a few hours. Whereas with the heat mat, yes, you do need to turn them down or turn them off after the plants actually start growing. So just, uh, you know, I've, I've said it before, I've killed more plants than some gardeners will ever grow. And so it's it's mistakes like that where one day with a heat mat killed 150 potential pepper seedlings, which meant I needed to start the whole process again, which meant I was about two to three weeks behind where I wanted to be, which meant that the pepper plants that ended up in my garden were smaller than they normally would have been, which meant I didn't get as good a harvest that year as I had hoped for. So one missed watering when they were at the seedling stage had a huge impact for the rest of the season. So not to scare you or worry you, but it is one of those things that you do need to stay on top of and, and be careful about because it is it can be an issue. Leafy greens, do seeds still germinate outside if it suddenly starts raining for three days straight? Uh, you know, so it's funny that you say that. Um, they'll probably germinate and whether they get flooded out or not 
is, is a big question, but uh, they might not germinate. One of the things that are required for germination is oxygen. And if the seeds are in a flooded area where there's just so much water that no oxygen is reaching those seeds, those seeds are going to absorb the moisture and they'll probably swell. It's going to take a little while before they rot, but they might not germinate if, if they're exposed to those steady rains where the soil is saturated. The seeds are, are incredible in how they're designed and they'll germinate when it's right, when the moisture levels are right, when the heat levels are right, and when the oxygen levels are right. And so if it's too wet, it's possible they might not germinate. So uh, it depends on the seed, depends on the medium that they're growing in, but uh, they might not germinate. You never know. Maybe, maybe they, you and your plants have a reprieve with, uh, as a result of, of all the rain. You know, there's always some help. <clears throat> okay, let's see. Um, Riverdale says, I also started putting my heat mats on a timer. When the lights go off, the heat comes on because I've also dried my plants to death in the past. Good. I know I wasn't the only one, but I'm glad you were willing to admit that because there are a lot of those problems that gardeners will do, but they don't necessarily uh, admit that they had that particular problem. So Joyce says, in our dry Colorado climate, the flats can dry out quickly. I do try to use the humidity domes until the plants are off and running and then also remove the heat mat. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and I and I do exactly the same. I leave my domes on uh, to help keep the soil moist as well because it is so dry here in Colorado. It's actually, with all the snow we've been having, our humidity is actually a little bit higher than it normally would be in January. But even with all the snow, it's still very, very dry. And when it comes to starting seeds, the humidity domes are are a critical part, especially if you're in a, a dry area like, like we have here in Colorado. Uh, keep doing the domes and, uh, and then modify the, the heat mats as needed and you'll have uh, hopefully more success with it. Coastal Crocus likes sweet Hungarian pepper, uses a sweet pepper early when yellow and then they get mildly hotter the more red they become. Um, good to hear that. I grew, I, I've mentioned this before, a couple Hungarian peppers last year from, or I should say, I got a single plant last year and then grew Hungarian peppers and then saved the seeds. And this year I'm looking forward to enjoying those Hungarian peppers and to also hopefully make some paprika when they get to that point where they're red and I'll dry them and make a nice powder from them. So I'm um, glad to hear you like the sweet Hungarian peppers because uh, there are just so much about peppers that uh, I think if you can grow them in your garden, it really adds a lot to your garden. We were talking about the shishitos. I just love the flavor of the shishito and they're just so prolific, but you can run across the, the, the spectrum of what type of pepper you might like and then grow those peppers and it, it's, they're sweet, they're hot, they're different colors. It, it's a good plant that I think is, is fun to have in the garden as much as possible. Monique wants to know if I've tried the sweet uh, dadle or daddle pepper. I haven't uh, from Florida. Grew the most, or grew the sweet and tasty and prolific. Um, I'll have to add that to my list as well to check out. I haven't placed my order yet, so you never know what I'm gonna come up with because a lot of peppers this year but uh, no I'm not familiar with that one so I, I'm always looking for a sweet pepper I here in Colorado I have great success with the hot peppers it's a little more challenging to find a sweet pepper that does well in my climate so um, I'm always looking for new ideas and new things that, that can help and uh, maybe that's the one to try out so I'm, I'm growing um, I think I've got three or four right now that I've already got planned. And so I'm hoping to do at least half a dozen this year. Uh, plants, varieties that I've never grown before that I'm now growing purely because of the recommendations from you all. And so I may or may not make a video about it. I'm kind of toying with a video at the end of this next season where I highlight that those six plants 
that I grew as a result of recommendations and then how well they did. I did that last year with the black cherry tomato and I'd never grown it before, but I grew it purely because it was recommended and I loved it. And so I'm planning on growing the black cherry tomato again this year. And so that's why I say always looking for varieties that will do well in my garden and you can do the same for your garden. You want to keep experimenting because rather than saying like I have done for years, I don't grow sweet peppers because sweet peppers don't do well in my garden. And that's a broad statement that is mostly true, but I know that there are sweet peppers out there that will do well in my garden. I just need to find those varieties. Some of the, the California Wonder Bell Peppers, wonderful pepper, does okay in my garden, but isn't prolific. I want that pepper like the shishito that just gives me a pepper every day that I go out to the garden looking for a pepper. So I'm always on the lookout and I appreciate that recommendation because it's the ideas that we don't know that can be most helpful to us when someone gives us the idea. So thanks so much for that. Uh, and Bohemian Herbology says, Lesia is the sweetest pepper I've ever had. Heart shaped with a thick wall, juicy, so good. Okay, I'll look into that as well. So thanks so much for that. That's, uh, that's another reason why I like getting together with you all because all over the world, there are other plants growing that I may not have discovered in my little Colorado garden. So good for you. Uh, Monique says the best tasting tomato is the yellow brandy wine. So delicious. That's another one that I've tried growing. I haven't grown the yellow brandy wine, but I've grown the red brandy wine. And it just I just don't have a long enough season for the brandy wines to, to fully develop. So um, maybe a yellow one. It's worth a try. You never know. It's something to check out. There's Jay on top of things. Thanks for that, Jay. Yeah, the Survival Seeds giveaway runs through the rest of this week. It's free. Go ahead and check it out. Three of those 100 seed packet seed bolts that are given away. And uh, it's, it. I guess there was some difficulty in the beginning with people trying to sign in and, and it didn't work from all platforms, but I think they've got that fixed now. If you're trying to enter on your phone or your tablet and it doesn't work, you may need to go to the PC, but I think they've got those issues fixed for allowing everybody to to sign in and uh i'll i'll ask them i think uh I, i've asked if they would give me the names of the winners they're all taking care of a random process to select the the winners so if i can get the names of the winners from them um it, it wouldn't be next week but in two weeks i'll plan to go ahead and let you know about that um, i do want to say next week before i forget that I've got a special guest. I told you that I was hoping to get her and that she was going to be on. And so next week it'll be a, a show with a guest and we'll be talking about seeds again, particularly tomato seeds and some of the seeds that we have chosen this year. But also back to this idea of trying what you all want me to try as a suggestion. That's one of the things we're going to be doing. We'll talk about that next week in the live stream. But some of the plants I'll be growing next year are going to be coming directly from your suggestions. So you'll have an opportunity and a role to help me choose which plants I'm going to grow. And that's going to happen next week. I do want to give a shout out to Brian Siebert this week because last week I got a notification that Brian had actually gifted five memberships. So we were talking, we've been talking a couple times today about the membership to the Gardner Scott channel. And I don't know how he did it. Uh, I, I really don't know how it works, but Brian gave five memberships to five of you. And so Brian, that is just incredible. I say all the time of just what wonderful people gardeners are and how we are giving and gracious and help each other out. And this is just such a perfect example of that, Brian, for you to gift the five memberships to other members of this group 
that are here on Monday. So don't know how you did it, but I do appreciate your efforts and I appreciate that you're willing to help out five people that you've never met before, but are part of this group that we have on our Mondays as we chat back and forth. And it seems like we all know each other. We recognize the names, we recognize the comments, and I know we all feel like we're part of this big happy gardening family and Brian has taken action to actually help others in that, that gifting. And so thank you, Brian. Incredible gesture. And I just wanted to, to point that out. I know you didn't do it to get recognition, but I think you deserve recognition for just being a great guy and, and sharing that, that you can share. And that's a big part of what gardening is all about, is sharing what we can share. And that is one of the last things I wanted to leave you with when we talk about the seed bundles is if you buy one or if you win one of the three that's being given away and you come across those seeds that you know you're not going to plant, you give them away. You share them with other gardeners who might want to be growing those plants and could benefit from a, a free seed packet. And so it's this, this idea that, that I love promoting amongst us gardeners is to share the excess that you have, share your knowledge, share the extra seed packets, share your time. And a seed bundle is an easy way to do that because particularly if you get a 100 seed packet bundle or a 50 or a 25, there's gonna be seed packets in there that you just don't need, give them away. If you've got a seed library at your local library, give them to the seed library. If you've got a school garden in your area, give them to the school garden. If you've got a family member who's interested in gardening, give it to that family member. Or just put it in a, a package on your front step with a table and a sign that says free seeds, take them. And they'll be gone in a matter of minutes. So uh, I like the seed bundles and I like growing new things but I also like giving away to the people I know in need. And so my seed packets are going to some local schools and they're going to some gardeners I know through my garden club that are new to gardening and don't know where to start. And so not only am I going to give them my seed packets, the extra seed packets I have, but I'm also going to give them some of my time to help make sure that they use those seeds in the best way that they can so that they have the success that they're looking for. So just wanted to leave you with that today. Hopefully that gives you some good ideas as to uh, whether you want to move forward with the idea of a seed bundle and how you can use it when you find out that you've got all those seeds that you may or may not need. Andrea, thank you so much for that super chat. Membership here is 100% money well spent. This is such a wonderful community. Well, thank you so much for that. And it's people like you, Andrea, that help make it a wonderful community. All of you are the ones that help make it a wonderful community. And I look forward to seeing you all here next week because remember, special guest, we're gonna be talking about seeds, but specifically talking about tomato seeds. And I want your input next week as to which tomatoes we're going to be growing this year. Hope you have a great gardening week. If you're like me with snow on the way, get all those indoor projects done. If you're in California inundated with the rain, get all those indoor projects done. But if you can get outdoors, get outdoors and get ready and have fun. And above all, enjoy gardening. I'm Gardner Scott. We'll see you next week.